button. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to our daily devotions with Pastor Sutton on this Wednesday, March 1st. We're in March, guys. It happened. I don't know how we got here. Two months have gone by. Here we are in March. So good morning. Glad you're here with us. Spend a little time in God's Word as we are here today for that. Uh, a little gloomy outside. The um, Now watch this. Um, the uh, the uh, snow is coming. We are we are uh, under weather advisories, and and you can see across here that this this snow is is coming. Um, when I'm not sure. It's not supposed to happen until later today. If I put this radar in motion, take it up till now, and uh, yeah, it's coming across there. And uh, you know, Michigan, you might get it too. You might get it too. So and, and we'll have to see what comes of this here in the hours. But <clears throat> good morning. Glad you're here with us to spend a little time in God's Word as we do each day here in our morning devotions, even during this Lenten season. Geraldine and Neil, good morning to you guys. Jill and John, good morning. This is can't be right because I've got uh, we got an update here. Well, maybe it is right. There we go. Okay, there we go. So Jill and John, good morning. Jerry, good morning. Thirty-eight. Yeah, we're well, we're we're messing right around just under 30, 28, 29. Here, and with the sunrise, it's probably a little warmer, which, you know, is ideal in that just under 30 and above, like, 18 is just ideal for the big snowflakes that really pile on the heavy, wet, yuck snow. Kathy, good morning to you. Looking forward. Oh, yeah, soup supper tonight at church. Sure, sure, we've got our... Lenten dinner, the youth group is preparing it here at, at uh, St. Paul and Irma for tonight. And then uh, tomorrow, I've got, I've got midweek on Thursday. And there we, have a, there we do have the simple soup supper. Um, that, uh, you know, just, just soup and bread and cheese. Down here, it's a meal. Next week, the men's breakfast, or the men, yeah, the men's Bible breakfast group has it down here at St. Paul. And um, I think tacos, I think, is what's on the the menu. I think I'm supposed to buy taco shells. Um, so we planned that all out on on uh, that that other day of the week, uh, Saturday. That's what it was. We planned it all on Saturday at our Bible study. Verna, good morning to you, Ann and Deb and Grant. Good morning to you guys. I'm going to refresh again here because I see there's more viewers and it hasn't updated. Um, nope, that looks like that's last one saying hi is Ann. So. I imagine there's more out there. Hello to those of you watching, but not saying anything, and that's okay. You're still hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Um, and that word is the preached and proclaimed word. It's not simply reading your Bible. Uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, and to those uh, watching later today, good afternoon, good evening, <laughs> good night. <laughs> I imagine there's a few people that do this as they're fading away at night. Um, Bonnie used to find my voice quite relaxing to go to sleep to when we'd read to each other. And uh, those watching on YouTube as well, hello there. Glad you're spending a little time with us in God's Word. Um, like, share, join our little group. That way you get the notifications. So, <clears throat> with all of the silliness done, let's go right ahead here and uh, get started. If you have the Lutheran Service Book, page 295, Daily Prayer, for individuals and families, I have the treasury of daily prayer right here as we begin in the morning order each day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My mouth uh, flipped. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our psalm today, uh, coming to us from Psalm 74, verses 10 through 17. Psalm 74, 10 through 17. How long, O Lord? Oh, no, that, I started off wrong here. 
I'm, I'm thinking, not reading. How long, O oh God, is the foe to scoff? Is the enemy to revile your name forever? Why do you hold back your hand, your right hand? Take it from the fold of your garment and destroy them. Yet God, my King, is from of old, works, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the sea monsters on the waters. You crushed the heads of the Leviathan. You gave him food. You gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. You split open springs and brooks. You dried up ever-flowing streams. Flip the page. Ah. Yours is the day, yours also the night. You have established the heavenly lights and the sun. You have fixed all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. If you'd like to enhance your, your uh, devotion today after we're done, you're certainly welcome. There's an additional psalm here, Psalm 126 in Psalm 6, if you'd like to go and read those on your own. But it's, it's significant. When I, when, when I began, I said, How long, O Lord? <clears throat> and um, I was uh, what the text says is how long, oh God, and there's significance. I've talked about this before. When you when you see the word God in the English text, especially in the Old Testament, um, what's behind that is the the Hebrew um, Elohim or Elo, uh, which is the word for God. Right? We we have different words. Um, uh, for the for the titles of the one who created us, so Creator. That's another one, um, and so, but but Elohim or Elo, uh, or El, um, uh, is is um, like Bethel, house of the Lord. Um, is that right? Oh, yeah, Beth. Beth is house. Yeah, Beth. Beth. Um, the L on the end is is um, God. Um, that name is used in 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 the times of of the Hebrews. Um, it's used by everybody, whether they're whether worshippers of the one true God, uh, Creator of the heavens and the earth, or their own idols. Um, it's just the word for God. Okay, a small G. Right? Now we put a capital G in the Bible when we're using Elohim um, because we're talking about the one true God. Um, but when, so when you see God, it's it in in, in the Old Testament textures, it's textures, texts, scriptures. See, we've got scriptures, and we've got texts. So you got textures. My brain is ahead of me today. Watch out. Um, when you see God, it's Elohim behind it. It's it's the it's not the name of God. It is simply the Almighty God. Um, but when you see Lord, and, and you typically see Lord in this way, capital L, and then the O-R-D in small capitals, um, that, is, that is the name of God. Um, that's, not, that's not Lord, it's actually Yahweh, the name, that, the name that Moses was given at the burning bush, right? Who shall I say, who shall I say is sending me? Tell them the God of their fathers, Yahweh. Tell them I am. That's what Yahweh means, I am. And it's not like I am, pastor. It's like everything. I am all that is, was, will ever be, Yahweh. Um, but the Hebrews weren't allowed to say Yahweh. They, 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 you know, they shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Don't say it, and you won't have to worry about using it wrong. So what they would do is they would say Lord, and the Hebrew for Lord is Adonai. And so as, as the Old Testament scriptures are translated into English, that, that's adopted. And instead of putting Yahweh in the text, the Tetragrammaton, which is the fancy name for the three letters that are God's name, Yahweh, um, they put in Adonai, Lord, Lord. Um, 
so yeah, um, there's your there's your uh, historical grammar, grammar, grammatical lesson for today. Um, yet God is my King. Uh, Elohim. Um, I'm trying to think of what the Hebrew for my King is. It's Mel. It's Melchi is King. Well, my Hebrew is not as good as my Greek, and my Greek ain't great. Why don't we stop with that? We'll go on with our reading for today. We'll go on to Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 20. Mark chapter 4 today, verses 1 through 20. Oh, this is, yeah, all right. A lot of, lot of meat here. <clears throat> so, Mark 4, beginning at verse 1. <clears throat> again, <laughs> again. He began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his, excuse me, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path. And the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns. The thorns grew and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seed fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand the parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, and they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, Immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. <clears throat> they are those who hear the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for things, other things enter in and choke the word. And it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus teaches in parables, and he does so with a purpose. Right? How do we understand the parables? How do we comprehend what they mean? Well, first, a parable is a, a story, a narrative, um, with a, a surface meaning, right? This is, this is about good farming. It's agriculture. Um, but also having a deeper meaning uh, for the believer and a spiritual understanding. Um, and the world can easily perceive the agricultural lesson here, right? I mean, you, you put your seed in good soil. If you want to get a crop, good soil is how you do it. Rocky soil is no good. Thin soil is no good. And the stuff that falls on the walking path, it's not going to grow. Now, remember that in 
the time of Christ. Um, yeah, Bonnie said everybody. Everybody's a farmer. Well, no, because you have tradesmen who work in town, but um, in in outside of the city, everyone farms, and even even in the city, people have some kind of subsistence farming going on. Um, but when a farmer plants his crops, he scatters the seed. Okay, it's it's in a bag that he hangs from his side, and then he scoops his hand and he scatters it, throws it. Right? They didn't have planters. Right? You didn't you didn't hook up. You didn't hook up the, the, the donkey to the 18-row grain drill and run it through the fields after you've been through it with uh, all of the other implements to process it, right? You had a single bottom plow that you'd pull through with an oxen to loosen up the soil. Um, and then and then maybe you'd go through with your hands. If you were a really dedicated farmer, you or your fam and your family would go through breaking up the big clunkers to get fine finer soil right the things you might do with a disc harrow or a spring tooth and then you just go out with your bag of seed and scatter it and you do your best to scatter it where it would land on the soil but some would get up on the rocks on the edge of the field or maybe there's a rock in the middle of the field or a walking path along the side of the field some of it's going to get up it's just, but it's going to go where it may you just scatter it right and agricultural lesson the stuff that gets in the good soil is the stuff that's going to grow and, and grow well. Now, the deeper meaning um, is is obvious, and, and you've heard it before. I'm not going to tell you anything new, I don't think. But this is what the preacher does, right? I've prepared the soil out there as best I can, um, and now I scatter the word upon the people. That's what Jesus is doing. And here he is at the, he, he's come to the edge of the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias, whatever name you want to give to it, depending on which way you come to it and who you are and what your heritage is, that's what you call it. Um, and, and he's standing on the edge and the people are encroaching upon him. Um, you know, and, and if you've got crowds up against you, it's hard to speak and, it, and it's hard for the people further back to hear. So he, we know from another text, he steps into Simon Peter's boat and says, push out. And he goes out a ways from the shore, and then he can address uh, the whole crowd. They can hear him. Amazing how, you know, I mean, in one place, he's talking to 5,000 men plus children and women that are there, and it could be easily, could easily be 10,000 or more people, and his voice carries, right? Today, we'd go somewhere and you'd talk to a crowd of 10,000 people, and the people in the back would be like, why isn't he using a microphone or an amplifier? So there was something about the way people spoke back then that allowed for better projection. But he pushes out and he begins to tell this, he begins to teach, and then the teaching is this parable. Well, he is scattering the seed of the word. And some of that seed is going to land on uh, different kinds of people, right? In that crowd are, are the, the ones who will be the apostles, right? We, in the previous chapter, we had them named, the twelve. Um, obviously, even within the 12, there are some who are, right? Judas is not, the seed is not taking root in Judas. Um, there are some who are going to hear it and be excited, right? But they're not really going to understand it fully. Um, there are some who are just there because they got dragged along and they're going to be like, yeah, whatever. And And it's just... You know, the old wicked foe is standing right next to them as the seed's coming. He's like, nope, you're not going to get that. Nope, nope, not for you. Nope, 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 not going to let you have it. You need to go after it if you want it. Um, and these are the different kinds of soil, right? So the ones that, that the devil is standing next to and are really not interested in what they're hearing, they just showed up because their buddy dragged them. They heard about this good speaker, and they, they hear him, but the devil steals it away and, and nothing happens. Nothing's changed about them. Um, then there are some that are um, uh, there are some that uh, uh, are on a rocky ground um, who hear it and they're like, ah, that's good stuff. I like hearing Jesus. I think this guy's got some good stuff to say. Um, and they're excited about it. And they want to follow him a little bit more. Um, but it's the, the root isn't deep. It's not digging into the heart. Um, 
And, and when the Pharisees show up to question Jesus, when the authorities come up to push Jesus aside, when Jesus is placed upon the cross, when he's hung on the cross, they flee. I don't want nothing to do with this. I don't want to wind up like that guy. And, you know, nothing. And then, and then there are um, others who are sown amongst the thorns. Those are, those are the people, who, the, the wealthy ones, uh, quite often are associated with this because the things of the world draw them away. Um, I think in the first century, there's a lot more to it than that because you've got, uh, you've got all kinds of unchristian lifestyles in the first century, still do today. Um, who, and these people come and they hear the word of God and they're excited about it. But I don't want to give up going to the, to the temple of the uh, uh, fertility gods and uh, taking advantage of the, um, the, the temple prostitutes. Um, or I, I, I don't want to, you know, I'm, I'm in banking and I want to continue to earn usury amounts of interest off the people I'm wanting to. Or, um, you know, I, I have my wife, but I don't want to be faithful to her. Um, I don't want to, whatever. I mean, pick your, pick your, grab one of Paul's lists uh, of, of sins and go down it. That's, you know, from, from pornea, which is the sexual immoralities, through the, the sins of life, right? They, they'd rather have those things than this thing. And this thing is choked by it. And they produce no fruit. And that's the goal, right? When you plant a field with seed, the goal is to have fruit, right? That it would abound. That Christ would abound in us. And by being in us, others would see it and they too would be called. They too would desire to have what we have received uh, through Christ. And so, so this, this is where the good soil comes in. Notice, it's not the person, it's the soil. Right? And it's the word of God that makes the soil fruitful. And so that is where, when the seed is sown, repentance comes forth, right? And that's what, that's what God desires of man, is a contrite um, and, and sorrowful heart over sin, and a desire to do better and to trust in him for all things. And so this is what we have. Those who are the good soil are the ones who hear the word of God and accept it and bear fruit, right? some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Now, it doesn't matter how much. God isn't checking at the end of the harvest how much, but that the fruit is born, that, that his word prospers out of the ones in whom it's planted. Not everyone, not everyone who hears the word or who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. We've got to be honest about that. Um, through the ages, the church has been fairly small. At times, collapsing down to one man. Right? I mean, think about it. You started off with Adam and his wife, Eve. One man. And they fell. They had sons who didn't make it. Then they had Seth, and that's when people began to came, call on the name of Adonai, the Lord. Um, and his, but, but even in that generation, right, they became so wicked that God wiped it out with a flood. And the church was down to one man, Noah. And then it built forth again from there. And, it, and it, it, the church again really kind of collapsed down to Joseph. Right to save it, or at least to Jacob, from which the twelve tribes come. Right, and those twelve tribes are the people of God. So the church came down to Jacob and explained that. Then in the first century, it came down to Jesus. When he's hung on the cross, he's the only Christian left. 
John was there at the cross, but they fled. All the others fled. But through contrition, a contrite heart, repentance, sorrow over sin, desire to do better, and the forgiveness of sins that comes through the cross of Christ, they came back. They returned. Even Peter, who denies Jesus three times on the night in which he was betrayed, later, at the Sea of Galilee, after they've been fishing, Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Three times. He says it three times. That's for each of his denials, he receives forgiveness. None of us are perfect. Not me, not you. None of us are perfect soul. <laughs> we're, like the, we're like the tree that doesn't produce fruit, and the vineyard owner comes and says, cut it down and burn it, and the, and the vineyard manager, the gardener, says, just start, st stop, let me dig up around it and pack some manure in around it, and see it's a trap. Pack some manure around it and, and see if we can make it a little, and then next year if it doesn't come. The steadfast love of the Lord will do us forever. His mercy is never ending. It's new each day. We live in that forgiveness. We are not in Christ by our own will and strength. We are in Christ by what he has done for us in our baptism. And we are assured of the promise of eternal life by remaining steadfast in faith. That doesn't mean that we're perfect. Not perfect. Never going to be perfect. Well, not until the day we die. And then he will perfect us. And in the resurrection, we will be perfect and glorified bodies like his. But to this day, for this day and for all the rest of the days that we walk this earth, we live in the forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life that comes through the blood of Christ shed upon the cross for you. Amen. Boy, that was some good stuff, wasn't it? That was, that was, that was all right. All right. Maybe I shouldn't write sermons. Maybe I should just go off the cuff. I wouldn't know what to say. Um, we'll have our prayer of the day, and then we'll go to our Lenten catechesis. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, of your bountiful goodness, keep us, or keep from us, keep from us all things that may hurt us, that we, being ready in both body and soul, having been made ready in both body and soul, may cheerfully accomplish whatever you would have us do through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lenten Catechesis for today, the fourth commandment. Boy, we, we had one, for it had its own day. Two and three, we pack them together. Four gets its own day. Not all commandments are equal. And breaking any of the commandments breaks the first commandment. So... Uh, if you do anything, you're going to break the first commandment. Because by breaking any of the other commandments, you're saying, well, I'm better than God, which makes you God and sets God beneath you. And then you aren't fear-loving and trusting in God above all things. Uh, you have more than one God. You have the God of, the, the, the triune God of me, myself, and I. I I've got a book that I, I bought that I haven't had an opportunity to read yet. And I'm kind of saddened by it, but, but, oh, see, I still can't, I still, my lighting is still not, oh, there we go, the unholy trinity, me, myself, and I, it's a bad move, all right, the fourth commandment, honor your father and your mother, Luther writes in a large catechism here, to the position of fatherhood and of motherhood, God has given special distinction above all positions that are beneath it. He does not simply command us to love our parents, but to honor them. Honor includes not only love, but also modesty, humility, and submission to a majesty hidden within them. Honor requires not only that parents be addressed kindly and with reverence, but also that both in the heart and with the body we demonstrate that we value them very highly and that next to God, Next to God, we regard them as the very highest. In this commandment belongs a further statement about all kinds of obedience to persons in authority who have to command, who, who, persons in authority who have to command and to govern. 
For all authority flows and is born from the authority of parents. Where a father is unable alone to educate his rebellious and irritable child, he uses a schoolmaster to teach the child. If he is too weak, he gets the help of friends and neighbors. If he departs this life, he delegates and confers his authority and government upon others who are appointed for that purpose. The same should also be said about obedience to civil government. Here, father is not one person from a single family, but it means the many people the father has as tenants, citizens, or subjects. Through them, as through our parents, God gives to us food, house and home, protection and security. They bear such name and title with all honor as their highest dignity, that it is our duty to honor them and to value them greatly as the dearest treasure and the most precious jewel upon earth. Besides these, there are still spiritual fathers. The only ones called spiritual fathers are those who govern and guide us by God's word. In this sense, St. Paul boasts his fatherhood in 1 Corinthians 4.15, where he says, I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now, since they are fathers, they are entitled to their honor, even above all others. So, from the large catechism section one, still working our way through the law uh, and the commandments. All right, let's continue with the Apostles' Creed this morning. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let me just pause here for a minute. I refresh my screen. I see Connie and Robin joined us. Good morning. Oh, they have appointments this morning, but listening while we can. All right. Good to see you guys. Mushtaq, good evening. Good morning. Jeannie and Bob, good morning. We pray for your uh, safe travel uh, on, on this day. And then uh, Bonnie said a few hides to people. So, all right. Continuing then, back to the matter at hand. The Lord's Prayer. We are bold to pray as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and glory, forever and ever. Amen. And for ourselves and others on this, it's not Tuesday, it is Wednesday, on this Wednesday morning. Lord Jesus, you have chosen me out of the world to be your own in time and in eternity. Though I am no longer of the world, you have not yet taken me out of this earthly tent into my eternal home. I am still in this world surrounded by dangers I cannot begin to number and exposed constantly to temptation. Let me never forget that this world will end with all its evil pleasures, and only those who do the will of God will abide forever. Increase and preserve in me that faith in you and in your redeeming work, which is the victory that overcomes the world. Give me that fervent love that would not think of choosing th the things of this world, its riches, its glories, and its pleasures, on their account forgetting you and your salvation. Teach me to despise the world's mockery, its hatred, its threats, knowing that even if it should succeed in depriving me of some advantage in this life, it can never rob me of you and your promise of life forever at your side. While I yet travel through life, preserve me in the faith that claimed me as a child of your heavenly household until that time when you would receive me into my heavenly home. This I ask in your most holy name. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray also for those this day for those who are in need. We ask that you grant safe travels to Bob and Jeannie as they return to Michigan. 
We ask also that you would be with those who are suffering in body, mind, or soul. Grant them strength where strength is needed, assurance when doubt comes forth, and comfort where death draws near. We pray especially this day for Pat, Lois, Anne, Brianne, Rose, Bob, Mike, Megan, Dan, Ezra, Neely, Jeremy, Ashley, John, Renee, Shazad, Holden, Shar, Deanna, and all those who call upon your most holy name. Grant them strength, O Lord, for each and every day of their lives until you come in your, and take them into your most holy and loving arms to rest forever with you until the day when we are all together again. This in Jesus' name, amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, who created and completed all things, on this day when the work of our calling begins anew, we implore you to create its beginning, direct its continuance, and bless its end, that our doings may be preserved from sin, our life sanctified, and our work this day be well-pleasing to you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me. The evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, my friends, that brings our Wednesday devotion to a close. God's peace be with you. And I will see you... Tomorrow's Thursday, right? Yeah, I'll see you back here tomorrow. I don't have Grace Lodge, so we won't necessarily be in a hurry. Um, but I do have all of the, the full day up at Harshaw's at uh, Faith up there. So God's peace be with you, my friends, and we'll see you back here tomorrow morning. God's peace. <laughs>